When I uh, taught for a number of years at Telba School of Theology, I used to teach a class in pastoral counseling. And I always began the class with an exercise. Everybody divided up in little groups of three, and they lettered off A, B, C. And each group was part of a larger circle. And for two hours, they had a chance to just respond to each other. After a few questions, A rotated this way and C rotated that way. It just mixed the class up. It got them involved with each other. Uh, they were to, at times, describe how they felt about certain things or what their family was like uh, from the age of 8 to 12. Uh, it was nothing threatening. Uh, they could leave their clothes on for the whole experience, for instance. So we weren't asking for any major disclosure. Uh, I remember one time I was sitting in a, a triad and I asked the question, uh, describe your family life from age 8 to 12. And uh, a young lady just looked at me and went, doo -doo -doo, on my shoulders. Why are you making us do this? Whoa. Uh, well, it turned out she was an adult child of an alcoholic. She never discussed her family, never talked about it. Five years now in full-time ministry. Uh, but just bringing that subject up brought that kind of a reaction. After two hours, I had everybody just close their eyes and just be aware of themselves. What are you feeling right now? How do you feel? I'd have them put a name on it. Then I had everybody share it. Well, most of it, it was a very positive experience, excited, anticipating, and, and uh, usually most of those students, by the time the semester was over with, had done it with their youth group or their board or their staff at church. And it's just a, kind of an interesting little mixer. But there was always a few who would respond scared, afraid, intimidated. Now, these are all graduate students, so you're not dealing with an average population. But almost without qualification, I can say that there's some unresolved issues in their past that cause them to be threatened with that possibility of some kind of self-disclosure. Uh, one young gal made an appointment with me the next day, and she said, I was one of them. I cried all the way home. I said, what's in your past? There was a pause. And, well, mom and dad were missionaries, and we came home from the field about five years ago, and my older brother committed suicide. What happened was the family just shut down. They don't have five children, they have four children. I said, what are you doing Saturday? Well, nothing. The semester just started, and I was doing a conference like this. I said, why don't you come as my guest? Well, okay. So she came, and halfway through, she said, wow, good stuff, but how does this relate to me? I said, you wait. She found out. <laughs> well, she found her freedom. She went home that night and pulled her sister aside and said, uh, I need to talk about my brother. Well, all right, but don't talk to mom. Went to her dad and said, I just need to talk about my brother. Well, okay, but don't go to your mom. Went to her mom. Mom cried, of course. But that family began to start again on a track of, of their own recovery. She herself, now this young lady, has a wonderful ministry in Southern California. You see, truth of the matter is, everybody here has had some tough experiences in their life. Consequently, you're not emotional neutral about anything. I could bring up certain subjects, and everybody here would have a different emotional response to it. I could talk about racial prejudice, uh, and some of you would be very uh, anxious about that. If you're white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in our culture, uh, it probably hasn't affected you very negatively, unless you've been a victim of reverse discrimination or some kind of affirmative action. But others have not been. And, and you would say, yeah, let's just talk about it. It's had a great effect on me. You'd be quite emotional about it. I could talk about rape, and the emotional response here would be somewhere between 2 and 10. 2 if you've never been raped, didn't know anybody that's been raped. I mean, you wouldn't be totally neutral because it's a sick thing. Yeah, that's a terrible thing. But if you were raped three weeks ago, you're in tears right now. Just because I mentioned the word. Triggered something in your life, and it can't help but do that. It could be so innocuous as to have a childhood memory. Uh, of a neighborhood bully whose name was Ralph. And every afternoon for one or two years you came home and Ralph terrorized you. Twenty-five years later, a guy walks up to you. Hi, I'm Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> now your mind would quickly say, oh, it's not the same Ralph, but you wouldn't be totally neutral probably. You think you would? Try this. You get married, and your first child is a little boy, and your spouse says, oh, let's name him Ralph. <laughs> Would you? Are you kidding me? You'd name him Ayatollah Kamini first, but not Ralph. I mean, 
Uh, see, truth of the matter is everybody had experiences like that. We've been talking previously about managing our emotions in our present day life. What if you've had trauma in your past? I mean, deep seated things. Those strongholds have been raised up in our minds uh, simply by the environment we've been raised in. We can renew our minds, but those deep traumas burned into our mind over time usually are because of great trauma, such as rape and incest and murder and divorce and death in your family, etc. How do we deal with those? Now, basically, this is my terminology. You probably won't find it in a textbook anywhere. I call that a primary emotion that has lingered somewhere beneath the surface because of some certain pain or trauma in our past. And then some present event comes along and triggers that emotion. I told you in our last uh, segment that the first gal I ever dealt with that I knew had a spiritual component to her problem, when as soon as I talked about her father, it was immediate, I got to get out of here. Or the young gal who said, why are you making us do this? Just bringing up the subject of describing your family and your home uh, brought that kind of an emotional response to it. Uh, and then as soon as we are exposed to that, that's what triggers that previous history I have. Some present event triggers that, and up comes that primary emotion, which you have very little control over. Uh, it, that, that feeling is, it just kind of lingers there. Now, how do people manage that? Well, by and large, what they do is they attempt to avoid any present event that would trigger that. I don't want to talk about that subject. I'm not going there if so-and-so is there. I don't want to watch that kind of movie. Now, if you think about it for a moment, if you've had a lot of trauma, there's places you can't go, people you can't see, uh, subjects you can't talk about. It can have a major effect on your life that causes you to respond you know, very strongly, emotionally. And usually, people have a tendency to stay away or avoid that kind of confrontation. Now, it doesn't stop there because that's latent. That's in my past because of trauma. Some present event triggers it. But your mind is, is still active today. And so you mentally evaluate that today. And what, what really happens after that is what I call kind of a secondary emotion, which is a product of your past plus how you presently evaluate that today. So somebody comes up and says, Hi, I'm Ralph. Ralph. But your mind says, wait a minute, it's not the same Ralph, give him the benefit of the doubt. And so your mind has a tendency to reevaluate that uh, according to your present condition. Have you ever done this, gone to a church meeting or work, for instance, and brought up kind of a controversial subject, and all of a sudden somebody gets up mad and walks out? And you go, what'd you say to them? I don't know. Well, you really don't know because you don't know the history, but you hit a button that caused them to respond a certain way. Now, what happens is, is that even though we have those traumas in our past, we presently evaluate it, and you kind of talk yourself down. Uh, you can see that in, a, you know, in our professional athletes for some, some big lineman gets his finger stepped on. <laughs> you know, and what do his companions do, his teammates? They come up, listen, meathead, we need you. All right. <laughs> now, see, you're not trying to get him to zero, because you can't get him there, but you can get him to a five. You want him to play under control. And if you want to see a good example, try biting some professional boxer's ear. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> and you get in that ring and control that guy. Not me, man. It was, <clears throat> oh, see, all of us have had that trauma. Now, here's really an interesting question. Does God want that kind of uh, problem in your past to have that kind of control over you today? No, I don't think so, see. But how do we deal with that then? Can we fix your past? Oh, absolutely not. God doesn't even do that. But I believe by the grace of God, you can be free from it. Well, that can no longer have any hold over you. Now, the big question is, is how? How do we do that? Now, understand that being a new creation in Christ, God has given you a new heart. Your mind has already been programmed because of certain experiences in your past. Your emotion has been somewhat set because of the way that you believed or what you thought in your past. Deeply embedded because of trauma experiences. Uh, so that's somewhat established already in your mind. But now having a new heart, being a new creation in Christ, I have an opportunity to look at that particular event again, but no longer as a victim of it. Now it's very easy to pass this off as pie-in-the-sky theology. But let me explain how we can get to a practical basis 
of, of being able to see that person, see that event, and totally set ourselves free from that past. Understand this. At that time that that happened, that event, that uh, rape or incest or problem in your past, you mentally evaluated it at that time. There was something that you believed as a result of that that you are probably still believing to this day. Now understand something. If you had some trauma 20 years ago, that is no longer what's keeping you in bondage. What's keeping you in bondage is the lies that you had believed as a result of that. God doesn't care for me. God doesn't love me. I'm no good. That's why it's truth that sets you free. Now I have a new opportunity. I'm a new creation in Christ. I can reevaluate that event, but no longer as a victim of it, but as a new creation in Christ. Let me illustrate that if I can for a moment. Uh, I was doing uh, my conference at Talbot a few years back. A missionary was sent home from the field after about 10 years of service. Uh, she was facing a, a mental breakdown, and they, they didn't feel she could stay anymore, so she went home. Now, she didn't go home to her family because at that time she had a very dysfunctional family. Uh, she was, uh, uh, came home and actually attended our one-week conference, much of what we're going through right here. And during that week, honestly, before God, she found her freedom in Christ. And she'd be happy to stand and share that with you. I um, mean, her problems literally got some sense of resolution. Then she went home to this family. There she found out that her father was carrying on a homosexual affair. He was about 70 years old with a very sick man. She didn't think her mother knew about it. She heard it from her brother. So they came back to attend some classes that fall at school. She made an appointment. Her and her husband came in to see me. And they told me the sad case and what was going on back home. And she said, well, now what do we do about that? I mean, he could have AIDS and my mother not know it. And uh, should we tell mom? What should we do? I said, well, first of all, put this in perspective. Two issues, number. Number one, aren't you glad that you went to our conference first before you went home to that? Oh, she said, if I'd gone from the field right into that, I think I'd have stepped over the line. I said, secondly, knowing that now about your father and your family, what does that do to your heritage? She started to answer, and then a smile broke on her face. Nothing. Do you see it, Christian? Who are you? Beloved, now you are a child of God. You no longer are primarily a product of your past. You are primarily a product of the work of Christ on the cross. Now, if you didn't have that opportunity, if that's not true in the gospel, then truth of the matter is no matter what kind of games we play, you're always going to remain a victim or somehow a product of your past. That's inherent in the gospel. I am a new creation. My spiritual life, my spiritual inheritance is my primary heritage. Even as a parent, uh, my brought my son, Carl, into this world. He is a child of Neil Anderson. But my major obligation is not just only to lead him to Christ, but to establish him in Christ so he understands that he is a child of God. And the one he has to answer to is his Heavenly Father. Otherwise, everybody would just be a victim of their past. Now, let me illustrate it in another way. Uh, this lady came to me and during one of our conferences, and she was just in tears after a night like tonight. And she said, uh, I was preparing for the mission field, my husband, I had two children, and, and I was working late at night. And one night, 10 o'clock, out in the parking lot, I was raped. One of the very ugly kind of experiences. And that was six months prior to that. They'd actually left the state. But she said, how do I make that right? I said, you don't make it right. It was a sick, evil thing. You don't make it right. Well, all things are supposed to work together for good. I said, well, they can potentially for you, but not trying to, to cover it over or make it right. It was, it was a sick, evil, sad, sad thing. We talked for a little bit, and I suggested, you, by the grace of God, she needed to let that go. Now, part of her trauma was, was, was that, oh, about once a month, she had to fly back to that city and look at the lineup. That's what she dreaded. Can you see why? Because just seeing that person would cause that primary emotion to just trigger again. So she called me that week, and she was half in tears. She said, how do I let that go? I can't let it go. I said, yes, you can. And so God, I think at that time, gave me an illustration. I said, suppose you're sitting in your house. Somebody drives by, throws a great big rock, hits the side of the house. And you went outside and couldn't find out who did it. How long would you let that bother you? 
Would you let that have some control over you the rest of your life? Oh, no, I, I don't think so. I said, suppose the rock went through the window and damaged some very nice furniture, and you couldn't find out who did that. How long would you let that bother you? Well, not very long. Suppose the rock went through the window, damaged some nice furniture, and broke your arm. How long would you let that bother you? Do you see where I'm going? Let's make it worse, worse. Is there a point where you say, that did it right there. Now that's going to bother me the rest of my life. I don't believe in the mind of God there is any time like that. I don't think God wants anything in your past to have that kind of control over you today. I really don't. Here's the maddening part about this illustration. I have seen people in our churches who won't let that first event go. You hung up on me two years ago and I'm never going to talk to you again. Some pity little thing like that, they allow themselves to live in the bondage of bitterness, be unreconciled to even their mothers and their fathers and their brothers and their sisters. And I've seen people sit in my office, have to come to terms with multiple sexual abusers, and I've seen them let it go. Right in front of my eyes, I've seen God set them free from their past. You got to forgive. What I want you to see tonight is, is that it is the truth that sets us free. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. It wasn't too long ago I was finished a conference and I spoke the next Sunday morning at church and at that time everybody had left and the lights were dim and I was just on my way out. We we're going to have lunch someplace with some of the staff at the church and and uh, there was a gal sitting kind of off the side, and she was crying. And one of the prayer counselors at the church came up to me. Could you talk with, with so-and-so? And she's not doing very well. And so as I approached her, she just, no, no, I'm not ready for that. And I said, well, okay, you know. And at that moment, I was ready. I was, okay, you know. And I was supposed to go to luncheon at that time anyhow. And then I thought, well, maybe I should talk to somebody. And, I said, well, let's just go in the back room here. And so the prayer is the lady, counsel went back, very attractive, 32-year-old lady. And how much time do I have here? You know, a few minutes maybe. And, and uh, here she is, 32 years old. She became a Christian about four years ago. But not being one during college, she was a professional lady. Uh, I just kind of asked, was there some difficulty in college? Was there any sexual promiscuity and drugs? Well, yeah. And, but that wasn't the issue she was struggling with at that time. Uh, 32, I said, are you married? No, I'm never going to be. I said, obviously, you got one major experience in your past. and You want to share it with me? Well, yeah, I mean, the dominant thing, obviously, was when I was about five years old, my, my uh, father left us. My mother had just come home from the hospital with uh, the third child, and, and uh, my mother was sitting there holding my baby brother or sister, and my father's leaving and my mother's crying and begging him not to go. And that one period of time in her life shaped her from that time on. I said, well, we just got a few minutes here. I said, would you be willing to do something? I'm not asking you to uh, do anything other than to be honest and recall the truth. Would you be willing to go back to that moment with me? Well, sure. I said, why don't you just close your eyes? Now this isn't visualization, I'm not suggesting any false memories here at all. This is a real experience. She has conscious memory of it, very clear conscious memory of it. But I said, I want you to go back, close your eyes. Well, can you just picture that room for a moment? Yes. I said, you, the whole room, do you see it? Do you see your mom? Yeah, my mom's here. And What's your dad doing? He's leaving and mom's crying, you know, the whole thing. And I just brought her back to that point again. I said, what are you feeling right now? What are you thinking? By this time, tears are coming down her eyes. I'm all alone. My fault. I've got to be strong. Mom's not strong. I've got to be strong. And she's just sharing. She just, I'm sitting there kind of mentally writing these things down. Everything she's sharing with me is a lie, folks. Just a lie, honestly. As a result of that trauma. And, and I just kind of kept mental note of those things. And she's sitting there quiet. Tears are coming down her face. I said... Who else do you see? Now this doesn't always happen, folks, and I can't promise this, but in this case, she said, I, I, I see Jesus. I said, what's he saying to you? He's not saying anything. 
He's just got his arms out. I said, why don't you go to him? Oh, it was incredible, folks. And at that moment that shaped her from that, I got to be tough, I got to be strong, you know, I'm all alone, I'm never going to trust any man. All that junk came out of that trauma experience at that time. And I remember sitting at the end of it, uh, I just kind of made mental note of all the stuff she told me that just simply was not true. Not true about who she was, not true about God. And I just had her go through a whole period of renunciation. I said, well, just follow after me. I renounce this lie. I choose this truth. I renounce the lie. I've got to be strong. I trust in the strength of Christ. She's a new believer, see. And by this time, she's a basket case, folks. And we were done. I mean, the whole thing lasted 10, 15 minutes at the very, very most. And finally, I looked at her. I said, I've got to go, but could I just uh, do one more thing for you? You've never really had a father. And I said, I'm old enough to be your father. Could I be your father for a moment? Oh, sure. I said, well, listen, as my daughter, I would want you to live a victorious life. I would want you to be able to get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and like what you see. And I just went through some like that, and I said, and I, I would want for you to not be afraid to have a son-in-law for me and to have my grandchildren. I can't even really explain to you what happened to me at that moment. I'm a grandfather. I got grandchildren. I know what that means to me. By this time, she really is an emotional mess. <laughs> so was I, for that matter, and so was the poor <laughs> prayer counselor. And, um, but I can't tell you what, what the truth at that moment did to set this gal free. Uh, all the junk that she had believed. You don't have to be tough. You don't have to, to uh, make some commitment never to get married, never to have children, because all of that's in the past. That, that it doesn't shape you. That isn't what God wants for you. And uh, allow me at that moment to just be a father to this young lady and to say, no, no, that's not true. What a privilege to stand in that gap for somebody like that. You know, over these years, I, I've had the privilege to sit with people and watch them forgive one person after another. It's a painful process. Let me just share this with you. Once I held in my tightly clenched fist ashes, ashes from a burn inflicted upon my 10-year-old body, ashes I didn't ask for. The scar was forced to me, and for 17 years the fire smoldered. I kept my fist closed in secret, hating those ashes, yet unwilling to release them, not sure if I should, not convinced it was worth it, marring the things I touched and leaving black marks everywhere, or so it seemed. I tried to undo it all, but the ashes were always there to remind me that I couldn't. I really couldn't, but God couldn't. His sweet Holy Spirit spoke to my heart one night in tearful desperation. He whispered, I want to give you beauty for your ashes. The oil of joy for your mourning. The garment of praise for your spirit of heaviness. I'd never heard of such a trade as this. Beauty? Beauty for ashes? My sadly stained memory for the healing in his word? My soot-like dreams for his songs in the night? My helpless and hurting emotions for his ever-constant peace? How could I be so stubborn as to refuse an offer such as this? So willingly, yet in slow motion, yes, while sobbing, I open my bent fingers and let the ashes drop to the ground. In silence, I heard the wind blow them away, away from me, forever. I'm now able to place my open hands gently around the fist of another hurting soul and say with confidence, let them go. There really is beauty beyond your comprehension. Go ahead, trust him, his beauty for your ashes. Being a new creation in Christ, I can look back at that. God wants me free from my past. The key to that is I have to forgive. Forgiveness is to set a captive free and to realize you were the captive. It's the one major issue God has provided for us to let that go. Now that's another lesson. But let me just tell you my own experience in this. <clears throat> I, can, I can go back to about the mid-80s, and, and uh, I was listening to the most incredible stories that, that people had endured suffering. And I remember driving home one night, I said, I don't want to hear this anymore. 
I mean, I don't want to hear this. Who wants to hear this? Honestly, I couldn't to this day if I didn't see the resolution. And remarkably, that's what stays with me, to watch that person walk out totally free from their past, finally some resolution, because that's what stays with me. And, you know, I don't know how these people sit in these clinics, listen to these hard case stories, and never see any result and just keep shooting them full of drugs or something. That's overwhelming to me. I don't know how they do that. Your heart would have to go cold after a while. But time after time, I've seen them make a list of who they need to forgive. And out comes one painful memory after another. And when they're all done, it's just an emotional exercise to go through that. And they just sit there at that moment, just kind of spent. And something inside of me, inside of you too, that wants to respond back to that person and say, I'm so sorry that that had to happen to you. You didn't deserve that. I'm so sorry, mister, that you never had a father who knew enough to affirm you and to love you. I'm so sorry, young lady, that you didn't have a mother who knew enough to build you up, but all your life put you down. I'm so sorry that people in this world are rejected purely because of an act of birth. Their skin color seems to be a little bit different than somebody else's. I'm so sorry. I just have to ask my black friends, God forgive us. That surely is not your sickness. That is ours, that we would do that for you. One of the saddest things for me, because I've been with so many ladies who have been sexually abused by men, and that abuser will never come back, never own up to it, never say they're sorry, never ask your forgiveness. You just feel stuck. Ladies, can I do that then for you? As a husband, as a man, as a father, ladies, would you forgive us men for the way we've looked at you and touched you? That's our sickness. That's not yours. I'm asking you for your sake to forgive us. Let it go. Would you pray with me? Father, wrap your arms around us tonight in the only way that you can. Give us the grace to face that pain and to let it go. Give us the grace to at least tonight consider the option that I'm willing to forgive as you have forgiven me. And Father, all of us tonight, all of us every night need the grace of God. Thank you, Lord, that we are new creations in Christ. Thank you for the gospel, the good news that we don't have to be a victim anymore, no longer. And God, give us the oil of mourning that you would bring that kind of freedom into our life. Lord, I pray that as we finish this whole series, that people will gladly choose that option and walk out of here, not only just a new creation, but free from our past and free to be the people that you've created us to be. We know in our own effort, we can't do that. And we need you, Lord. We need you to perform that miracle in our lives. But God, you need us to respond, to exercise our own will, to make those choices. So give us a grace to do that, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.